Uh, so Colin, thanks very much for coming on. Uh, how are you finding sort of the lockdown with no sport? Uh, it's difficult. It's um, frustrating. I suppose the recent announcement from the GA doesn't help the, you know, the the levels of enthusiasm or anything. You know, it's 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 difficult. Um, if we have to wait till October for GEA and your job is a GEA show, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not the easiest. Uh, it's not the easiest position to be in morale wise. Yeah, I suppose how we've been finding that. I know you've been continuing the sort of the show yeah, weekly, but content wise, I suppose you're nearly going into the archives, like maybe RT at the moment. Yeah, well, I've been doing nostalgia shows for the past seven weeks, and I don't know. I think they might have. Um, I don't know, I think people might be a little bit bored of them now. I'm doing tribute shows now, so they get me out. I'm doing going to do a few more live shows as well. So just to keep up with the, you know, what's happening on a weekly basis. But it, look, it's not easy. This is seven weeks in. If we're mm. waiting until September, October for matches, God knows what I'm going to be doing in September. <laughs> I, who knows? Maybe I'll take a month holiday. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, so we saw John Horn on the Sunday game. I suppose, what did you make of the sort of speech um, that he gave to Des Cahill. Yeah, well, like, I mean, I, I don't have hu such a huge problem with it. I have a huge problem with the amount of people saying he was uh, brilliant and, you know, great leadership and all these things. All he did was lock down for two months, mm. more than the government advised. There's a lot of people out there frustrated that they can't get out to the local pitch and do anything. They can't even get out and walk on it. And when the government and their medical experts are saying that pitches can open on May 18th, I just can't comprehend why the GEA would wait two more months. And of course, the idea is over saving lives. But what? how does that change on July 20th? There's still a risk mm -hmm. on July 20th. So if it's a, a complete, we don't want to lose one life, well, then we don't open back up until a vaccine is found. The whole idea is trying to find a balance between living with this disease and getting back to some sort of normality. Now that we've, you know, flattened the curve and we're past the worst of it, now we should be getting back to normal, not increasing lockdowns. Yeah, I was kind of leaving from listening to him. as near like until a vaccine comes, he's not even going to really consider it. He said social distancing, if you can't well, do he on said, a... he said He said until social distancing ends. The reality is there will be social distancing. That's what's going to be recommended until a vaccine's found. Yeah. So like, I mean, how can he just come out with a date like October, you know, and say that we can't play while social distancing? And another big point is, why are they restarting? If they're trying to be conservative and cautious, why would they restart with club games, which, which you know, will affect every player in the country? Why not start with the inter-county yeah. games, which is only 2%, and those players could potentially be tested and their temperatures taken and be a lot safer? It makes no sense to take a very conservative approach and yet start back with the whole country. Why not use the inter-county players, you know, as a, you know, a case project, for example, and be more cautious, start back with that and see where you go from there. Yeah, I suppose, would you even welcome, I suppose, from an inter-county player's point of view that he did sort of say you can nearly relax the training because... I'm sure they would have been probably training hard knowing that there could be a championship July, August, but at least they know now that it's way down the line. It's way down the line, but like these fellas never get out of shape. So mm. like, I mean, if while well, they're over Christmas, they're still staying in shape. It's not like the days when I played where you come back in January or February with a big belly on you and stuff like that. These lads are, tra these lads are athletes and they want to train. Now, at least October has made them realise, look, it's not, you know, in the next couple of months and inter-county managers will give them a few weeks off. But that doesn't mean these lads stop training. Mm -hmm. You know, it just means they lower the intensity, for example, of the training, but they'll still train. They all enjoy training. Like, I mean, I'm 41 and if I don't do a bit of training during the week, I feel lazy. You know, I feel lethargic. Like, imagine what these high performance 20 year olds feel like. I mean, it's not, there's no chance that these lads are not training. If the only option was to play it behind closed doors, would you sort of welcome that? Like just having football in general, just yeah. to watch? I do. It's better than nothing. Like a lot of players are saying that they don't like it. Of course they don't like it. Who wouldn't, who would like to kick a point and hear nothing? So we've all played challenge matches, mm -hmm. but these matches would be on television. It would have people talking about it, supporting their county again, watching it on TV, reading the newspapers, you know, like all the, all the things outside of, supporters at the match will still work you know like i mean of course it's not going to be the same product without supporters 
But like, I mean, like John Horan said, one thing I did agree with him, like, I mean, Crow Park holds 70,000 people. You could put 20,000 people in there easily distanced from each other, you know, every third seat, you know, and maybe one row between each each row. And you would be well be able to do that, I imagine. So, like, I don't think it'll ever be behind closed doors. I think that that's not going to happen. I do think that it will be with way reduced crowds, like in Omore Park. It's a capacity of twenty thousand. You might see two or three thousand allowed in, and we leash will be lucky to get that anyways. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I suppose moving on, we, the, there was games this year. The sort of the rule changes came in. Um, sort of the big one was the advanced mark. Now, no, I don't think you were a big fan of that. What? What's your sort of your thoughts on it? No, well, like I mean, the advanced mark was actually my idea to begin with, but I don't like what I don't like what they did with it. So the idea was that initially was that any kick outside the 45 that was caught inside the 21 could be marked mm. now usually if the ball is being kicked from that distance you're going to be tightly marked in there and it's going to be a contested ball so like if you catch it under pressure from 25 meters or 25 yards to outside the 45 inside the 21 24 um you know you Sometimes when we see good catches, you don't mind the game being stopped for a mark. It's better than having them get be surrounded by two players. The problem with it now is that players are catching easy marks since they've extended it out to the 45. They're not being marked sometimes. They're just catching it into their belly. And it's slowing down the game. And do you really deserve a free shot at the goals for catching a ball into your belly? I don't think you do. You know, and obviously... If it's outside the 45 and inside the 21, you have the clear markings on the pitch, which is much easier for referees to know, you know, was it kicked outside? Now they're guessing what the 20, whether it was 20 yeah. metres. There's no way if one player is running towards the ball and one player is running towards him with the ball, you can actually judge when the, the ball was kicked if that was 20 metres. It's impossible. They've enough on their plate. So I don't know why they changed it. I think the advance mark could have been a good... Like, we might only have seen the advance mark maybe two or three times in a game, you know, but it might add a little bit of drama to lob one in and, you know, inside yeah. the 21 and catch it. I think what they've done with it is they've ruined it for everybody. And I can't see it. I can't see it um, lasting too long, you know, in its current form. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the small little punt kick and Stupid, the players yeah. in the first 40 metres and you can yeah. hear nearly from the groans from the stand the groan, the slowing yeah. down. But you don't mind, like, I've even seen a few big high catch sort of just around the 20 metres. That deserves sort of a reward for it. I think so. If you're being tightly marked and you yeah. catch a really difficult catch, do you, like often when you catch a ball like that, you come back down. The man who's marking you will start tackling you. A sweeper will come across and you actually get no reward for having caught a great ball. So mm -hmm. the mark would have been a good, you know, tool in, you know, in that case. But as it stands now, you, like the big one was Michael Murphy. There's been a few different ones. He just caught a ball, a punt little ball into his belly and just and just slowed down. And, you know, it was like compromise rules. Nobody wants to see that. And I suppose the other one was a black card. Now, that's caused problems through the years. I think it's not a bad idea, but probably needs a bit of tweaking regarding timing. Would you agree with that? Well, the black card, yeah. Well, this should be on a clock. Like, you yeah. shouldn't be allowed to waste time. But again, they'll tweak that. But the sin bin is a much better punishment for a black card offence than, you know, having to leave the field and a sub come on. It's much better. It's what it should, should have been done from the start. And if it had been done from the start, I don't think the whole black card punishment wouldn't have, have got as much bad press at all, you know, because you're just out of the game for 10 minutes and you come back. Um, you know, so like, I mean, that will work well. And eventually... Gaelic games are going to go on to a clock like the women's game. It makes sense. You know, it's everybody in the stadium knows what, what they're dealing with. The only problem with that is there is 10 seconds left on a clock. Yeah. The game has been an absolute classic. Say Dublin catch a ball in midfield and everyone in the stadium is saying, go up and score a point, a, a draw would be a fair result and they run out of time. Yeah. You know, that would take a bit of getting used to. Yeah, I suppose. Would there be any other rule changes you would make or would you just leave us and think too many at one time is, is enough? Oh, we have enough of that now. Like that conversation has been done. I think the game, I think the rule change would be to change back the mark. Um, mm -hmm. I think the pass back to the goalkeeper from the kick out is a good one. That was just kind of snuck in there, but I don't see why anyone would have a problem with that. It doesn't mean goalkeepers can't come out. It just means they can't take a one-two from a kick out. 
you know, they can still come out in general play and take a pass, you know, because it's not like we're trying to get goalkeepers stuck on their line and, you know, and reducing the role they have in the game. Niall Morgan, who loves it probably the most, and, and Graham Briody from, from mm. Leash, they can still march out the field. They just can't do it from a one-two from a kick-out. And I think that encourages teams to push up on the kick-out. It gives teams more of a reward for putting a high press on that that sneaky little one-two can't happen and then you're down a man, you know, and it messes up your press. So, uh, no, I, I think we need to give it a few years now before we start talking about rule changes or people will start losing their minds. Yeah, they were even talking about bringing a, a black card into hurling and all the hurling ones did not want to <laughs> no, any sort of they, change. They, they did make a fair point. The pundits on the GAR told me that like 10 minutes down to 14 men in hurling, like the game could be over. Like, you know, mm. hurling such a high scoring game yeah. that that advantage could ruin the game in that 10 minutes, you know, and then you get your player back on and they said it's different in Gaelic football, but in hurling, there could be two, two gone in there in, in that 10 minutes game over game ruined, you know? Yeah. So they're kind of, they're pushing back on it. To be honest, when you have players who and pundits who know an awful lot more about hurling than I do, you just accept what they're saying that that probably makes sense. Would it be fair to say sort of the football ch- championship anyway, it's not the league, has been sort of in decline the last decade? Like you might get a handful of good games, semi-final or final in August and September. Would that be a fair comment? Ah, yeah, that's, that goes without saying. Yeah. It's been since 2011 to about 2017, 18, it's been pretty shit. And when you look back, like, the, the argument I hate is when people talk about oh, what do you want? Do you want to go back to 1970s football where they just drove it up the field? And it's like, no, that wasn't great either. No one's comparing it to that. No one's comparing to 80s football. Probably 90s football and the noughties football was the, was the best combination of hand pass, possession football, always going forward with the ball, taking risks, and yet, and yet being, you know, tactics haven't come into the game. After 2011, the game, it just went into... It was semi-interesting for a while to see how yeah. teams could potentially break this down, you know, but it got to a stage then where it just got too many games turned into stalemates with both teams playing the same way. And it's just, oh, you'd lose the will to live watching it. Like, it was horrific stuff, but it is moving away from that now. Like, I mean, that managers realise that the way to the way to win games is to score, not to stop the other team from scoring. So, like, I mean, there has to be a balance that if you go 90% defensive, you know, you're not going to score enough. You have to try and balance that out 50-50 or you're not going to, you're not going to, you, you might win some games, but you won't be successful. Yeah, I think people were nearly going by the Donegal model. Jim McGuinness, he sort of brought in semi-finals 2011, tweaked it a bit. He won the All-Ireland. People are nearly thinking, oh, sure, if he can do that with, I mean, not an average group of players, but not like a, a Kerry or Dublin yeah. group. Well, he tricked every he tricked everybody. Like I mean, he did it. He he brought in the counter attack football yeah. to that degree, and it took years for he, it. Still worked in two thousand and fourteen. Dublin still got suckered into it. Yeah. So like I mean, then everybody copied that. Then everybody figured out that you know don't don't uh, don't commit everybody forward. And when you do commit people forward, if you if the ball is turned over, work like a dog to get back, you know, or maybe foul them up there so that they can't, you know, hit you on the counter attack. So like when it was figured out, it doesn't really make sense why managers would continue with it. Like it's been figured out now. That tactic is old. Nobody's winning with it anymore. So it's go- you're going to have to change it some way. You're going to have to more have more of a variety to your game. Uh, in terms of the structure, I suppose many people are saying now the actual league, National League, is more entertaining because you're playing teams of a similar sort of uh, level. Now, they brought the Tier 2 in, that, that won't happen this year, but would you be in favour of the second tier and sort of splitting them up sort of um, in terms of level? Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I think that's fair. I think that the reason we see some of the defensive game plans is because to be fair, some teams just have no chance against another. So they have to, and in, in the GEA generally, you'll only practice one game plan. So, you know, you're stuck with this for the year. So the problem is they go, right, say Leash or Carlo are going to play Dublin in the championship, right, we need a defensive game plan. That's yeah. perfectly understandable. But if Leash play Westmead, they don't need to play like that against Westmead. So if you know at the start of the year, you on paper, you have a chance of beating anyone well, you might be less inclined to be so negative, you know, I think like, I mean, there's no sport in the world that doesn't have their main competition broken into leagues, 
based on ability. Like, I mean, mm. cup competitions are different, but I think it's fair. I think the best thing, the thing I would be in favour of is just flipping the season around and playing the league in the summer and playing the provincial championships in March and then starting your league. You know, you've got your four divisions join up one and two, join up three and four, and there are your two divisions, and work from there. Yeah, it's even. The, I think it's even the sort of having the amount of games. Players probably want to play their seven, eight games in the summer rather than the start of the year, but even the tier two, you lose your first provincial game, you lose the first sort of second tier game, you only have two games still. Yeah, well, I don't like the way it's done now because there's a huge stigma to starting in the A and dropping back to the B. Because even with the qualifiers, if you lose in the provincial championships and you're back in the qualifiers, there's a huge lull in the squad. Like, I mean, it's like, oh, we have to regroup now. Yeah. And that's regroup that's regrouping to get back into the actual same competition you were in. But if you lose in the A competition and you have all these dreams of maybe getting to a Leinster final or an Ulster final, Munster, wherever, and then you lose and now you're in a B like, let's be honest, when we're all in school, who wanted to be on the B team? Nobody. So, like, I mean, now you're being thrown back into the B. What I think you should start in the Division 2 and play off your Division 2 championship and then the winners and the finalists come up into the A the following year. And, you you know, you're coming up and down. But your target at the start of the year is to win a Division 2 All-Ireland final. Not to start in division in the A and be stuck back in the B and then have to let's go, you know, drop off the panel and go playing club and the interest isn't there, you know. And in terms of the actual All-Ireland, you'd probably say Dublin are top, well, they are top. Then you have probably just Kerry and then it's kind of a big sort of drop maybe to Donegal and Tyrone. Yeah, Galway are there definitely this yeah. year now as well. Like, I mean, for me... Um, for me, it's Dublin. Kerry could beat Dublin on a given day. Donegal could beat Dublin on a given day. Galway could beat Dublin on a given day, potentially. Like, especially if it's knockout. Could Tyrone beat Dublin on a given day? It's doubtful, if unless they have all their fellas back, yeah. if Conor McKenna came back. Um, you know, they're up around that mix. I think that's where you see the drop-off then. I think Mayo aren't, um, you know, like, I think they're on the slide, if we're being honest. What they're yeah. doing to Lee, to Lee Keegan, I think, is is outrageous the best wing back of his generation like he's stuck in corner back like i mean i don't know how i just don't know how lee keegan is yeah. is is putting up with that but like i mean i think i do think may were on the slide I, st I still think they'll be in the shake-up and could pot potentially be tyrone donegal um for the next couple of years but i can't yeah. see them being any sort of a force you know looking into the into the future i think the age profile of galway Kerry, Donegal, Tyrone, they will be, you know, challengers. I think that's where we see the drop off then, you know, after that. The the Russ Commons and the Cavans and these teams, you know, there there's a good drop down to those ones, even to the Armaz. Yeah, Dublin have the five in a row. Would you say they could get I mean, I thought they might get seven or eight. Would that would you think they yeah, can? Well, look, they'll be favourites to get seven or eight, you yeah. know. But like I mean, you have to remember Jim Gavin's not there anymore, and Jim Gavin was an outstanding manager. Um, you know, so it, it's not going to be easy to follow him. Like, you know, any successful manager just won five in a row, never been done in history. And you have to come in and follow him. So, like, I mean, we have to wait and see how he makes the team his own. We have to wait and see how good Dublin play under Jim Gavin, because you have to, or under Desi Farrell, because you have to remember, Jim Gavin changed to a pretty conservative approach for a lot of games for the, in the last two years. Like, will Desi go you know, change it to going all gung-ho again and, you know, could it potentially be caught? You know, we, we don't know enough about Dublin because poor Desi was dealt a pretty bad hand getting the job at the end of November. Yeah. And then and then they went on holidays without him, with, with the old yeah. management. And then the coronavirus hit. So, like, Dublin are, way, Dublin are well behind other counties. Yeah. For, they wouldn't be under Jim Gavin. But for a new manager, you know, they're definitely behind other counties. And if it's knockout, the, the lucky thing for Dublin is that they're in Leinster. And there's, you know, you'd be amazed if anyone in Leinster could um, shock them. But if Dublin, for example, were in Ulster or in Munster and drew Cork or Kerry, you know, or they could get caught in a semi-final. But like they'll, they'll probably win Leinster and have, a, you know, two or three games under their belt before they get into the... the I don't, I'm not sure if there'll be quarterfinals this year now or, se or straight to semi-finals. Yeah, like that's the thing you don't know. Not sure. Uh, I know you have to go in a, in a minute or two, but I, just one last question the sort of talk you can nearly make case for any sort of player from a, a, pro a certain province but who would you say would be the best player in the country at the moment I, 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 that's impossible 
right? So you can't, you can't, I can't answer that question because, like, I mean, how can you compare the best corner back with the best corner mm. forward? So, you, like, I mean, I, I, you just simply can't answer that question. Like, I mean, the best full forward in the country is Michael Murphy. The best number 13 is David Clifford. The best midfielder is Brian Fenton. You yeah. know, the best wing back is Jack McCaffrey. Like, you can't say who the best is, you know. I, I, for me, I don't want to be a party pooper now and ruin that question because <laughs> people like playing that game. I just don't get it. I don't get how you could, how it could be between David Clifford and Jack McCaffrey for the best player mm. in Ireland. What are you possibly basing that on? They're completely different players. So I don't know. You'd have to look for a best 15 of me, which we don't have yeah. time for, Sarah. <laughs> oh, we'll get you eventually, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and anyways, thanks very much for coming on, Willie. No bother at all, Dara. And uh, yeah, keep an eye on the channel, like, share, subscribe. Thanks very much.